So hi, everybody. Very excited uh, today to chat with uh, Tim Proom from, from Tarsus, one of our, our longtime customers. And, and the reason I'm really excited about this is that quite often when we're out in the field talking to prospective customers or existing customers, the question comes up around, well, what does the journey for implementing WMS look like? What are the benefits? You know, what are the challenges? And, and what should we expect in the long term? So Tim, being a, a, a battle-hardened veteran of this, has, has kindly agreed to, to take us through his experience uh, over the past four and a half years, I think it is, Tim, um, mm -hmm. around you know, implementation, optimization, and then how the use of, of the Manhattan WMS has really helped mm -hmm. improve and optimize uh, Tarsus's business. So what we're going to try and do in this series is, is break it into a three or four part series because... Tim's got a lot to tell, and, and I think there's a lot that the that people out there can learn from Tim's experiences. But rather than, than make this a, a, a 25, 30 minute long video, breaking into three or four digestible parts, will hopefully be really helpful to everybody out there. And the way that we're going to try and do this is, is under three core subheadings. So, you know, initially, like what drove Tarsus to think about supply chain optimization? And what did the journey to, to WMS and supply chain stabilization look like? You know, that in itself is a, is, is a fairly enormous task. Then we'll, we'll jump into really the, the crux of, of, of the benefits that the Tarsus um, were able to achieve and how they achieve those really under two, two subheadings, uh, optimization and culture change. And I think Tim and the team at Tarsus really uh, did a great job around that. And, and I think those experiences will be really valuable to everybody out there. And then the third part uh, will be around, you know, where are you now and, and what are your plans for the future and what have you been able to do as a result of those optimization um, and, and, and business process improvements that, that you've been able to put in place. So, so thank you so much, Tim, for, for agreeing to share your experiences with the world, I guess. Um, and, you know, maybe let's, let's just kick off a little bit um, and talk about, you know, yourself and, and, and why Tarsus went on this journey. Well, thanks for having me, Mike. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, and it's always, I've found it helpful as we've gone along this journey to be able to help and encourage other, other customers that are, are going through, you know, a similar journey to what we went through. So really excited to, to be uh, with you today and, and, and with the viewers as well. No, excellent. So, yeah, maybe you can just, I mean, you've got an interesting story of, of when you, you joined Tarsus in the, in the life cycle of WMS implementation, but maybe you can tell that and just a bit of backstory as to why Tarsus went on that, that journey for supply chain optimization. Yeah, so um, what a, a lot of people who have been to the Manhattan Scale conferences would know that um, I had the, the fortune of, of starting at Tarsus the week of the of the rollout of the WMS, which was a very exciting time. Um, prior to me arriving, Tarsus had had a, um, a strategic decision a couple of years prior to, to that, to say that supply chain in, a, in, in the tech industry as it was at that time, where the margins were you know, ever decreasing, um, they, they saw supply chain as a strategic um, move that, that could possibly turn into a, um, a, a sellable service at a point. Um, and thought that that would be a, a, a strategic advantage in the industry. So that was the vision prior to me starting. Um, they had gone down the route of, of evaluating all the different role players within the, uh, the WMS uh, industry. And they had eventually settled with Manhattan Scale, obviously because it is out and out, you know, the best, uh, the best system or platform in the world. Um, and also was quite prominent in the, in the tech industry at that time as well. So it was kind of a no-brainer to, to go with Manhattan scale. Um, and yeah, so, so for me, I started with, uh, you know, the week of that, roll, uh, that rollout, which was very interesting. I'd come from a, a different industry altogether as well. So not only was I new to Tarsus and new to Manhattan scale, I was also new to all the people that were in this 26,000 square meter facility um, and the, the product that was going to flow from here as well. So an interesting time. Um, what we had was that week, um, what I found was, you know, I was going from meeting to meeting. I was just a new guy. I was attending, trying to catch up and, and learn as much as possible. Um, and it, it all felt pretty normal. It, it, you know, there was a bit of excitement in the air. There was a lot of confidence around that, 
Um, this take on was going to be the, the game changer and everything was going to go perfectly well. And we went then into the Friday night where we started to do the take on. It took us majority of the weekend. Uh, there was 30 odd thousand bin locations to, to take on. And when I say the take on, that was scanning every product in there, adding quantities, serial numbers uh, where necessary on, on selected products. Um, and then uh, basically then having to try and match that against the original ERP, who that, that was the master of, uh, of inventory at that time. So, so ultimately a, a stock take on steroids, um, if, if you will. So uh, not only um, bin locations, but also products, serial numbers and quantity. So quite a major one. Um, and that's where it started. On the, by the Sunday evening, we had completed the take on. Uh, and we thought we had done that superbly well. And then we, we took a few of the orders that we had held back on the Friday evening and we, we waved those on Sunday night to just get a feel for the system and see where we were at. Um, those we were able to pick and we, we kind of went home, closed the doors and thought um, everything would be amazing on Monday. Um, luckily, we got a good sleep on Sunday night because Monday the fun started. Yeah, maybe, maybe tell us a little bit about that, Tim. <laughs> so what we found is that um, as we were getting the orders in, so the orders were coming in as normal, um, and it is a big warehouse, it, it does have a big flow through, um, and we just found orders starting to get stuck, um, and that was that became the terminology. It was a very technical term, but the products were getting stuck, um, the orders. Um, there was two main problems that, that were evident right at that time, or, or possibly three. Uh, it was two evidently at that time but a third that was creating it. Um, the first one was the serial tracking. Um, I think that prior to me starting in the lead up to it, I think that there was um, uh, sort of a misunderstanding from a, from a TASA's perspective as to what full serial tracking meant. So I think that the business rule had been from our big vendors, um, the big tech vendors, uh, was to say that they want full serial tracking. Um, and there's very good reason for that, but I think that the understanding of what full serial tracking is for a, a big vendor, as opposed to what it meant in Manhattan scale were very different things. Um, and so what it meant was every time that you moved a product in Manhattan scale, whether it was from one bin to another bin location, um, you ended up with a, a serial scanning. Um, and then what we had found at that time was that the, from the take on, the guys who had done the serial um, scanning didn't quite know what they were supposed to be scanning and had started, started to create this database of, of junk really. So that old adage of garbage in, garbage out really started to play dividends there. Um, so what we had to do is urgently get back uh, to, to the vendors and, and understand exactly what it is that they wanted. And what we then found was that they either wanted uh, just an inbound scan and an outbound scan or just an outbound scan or nothing at all. What we were doing was full serial tracking, which meant, as I described just uh, earlier, was to say that if I moved it from bin location to bin location or virtual warehouse to virtual warehouse, I was having to enact those scans. That meant that we had all of these, uh, this, this volume of orders stopped in its tracks and, and not being able to move anywhere. So that was, that was probably the big, uh, the big one. Uh, the second one was uh, we had created a consolidation area because you have multiple locations within the warehouse. Uh, what we were doing is exacting different uh, picks from different portions of the warehouse and then bringing them to a single consolidation area. In that consolidation area, you would match box one of three, two of three, three of three, and we were consistently missing a box. Um, so we may have been missing number one or two or three of three. Um, and so therefore, you could just never conclude that order. You know, the, the, the business process was to conclude that order consolidate that order and then hand it over to the courier partner in its in its entirety we couldn't part ship and we couldn't part hand over so you started creating this environment and at that time we were doing probably two and a half to three thousand orders a day um you know with boxes you know it's a two to one relationship so two and a half thousand orders equaled uh, five thousand boxes so you can imagine how that started to 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 pile up and especially as this thing um, you know, as the issue just compounded, um, we just ended up with boxes everywhere. It was, uh, it was a fun time. What, what was the main reason there, Tim, that, you know, you couldn't complete the pick process? What was really holding that back? Yeah, so the challenge for me, and I, and I think this is kind of 
was the, you know, the, the blessing, I guess, of, of coming in new and fresh eyes and not having a day to day to, to have to work to, I could, I could simply focus on a, on a, you know, what was broken and what was working. Um, and so I was able to draw a, a life cycle of a product at that time, and then just start trying to understand um, where the challenges were. And what we did is we followed that all the way backwards. Uh, you know, we kind of reversed the supply chain or the value chain. Um, and what I found more and more was that the, the inaccuracies uh, of inventory uh, was actually causing the, the challenge in those boxes, because obviously if, if the system said a product existed in, uh, in bin location A, um, and they get to A and that doesn't exist, obviously they can't complete that pick. Um, and so we had to then just start trying to understand why we had this, um, these massive discrepancies in inventory. Um, so we started to go backwards further and further into the supply chain, all the way back to the GRV. Um, the GRV was problematic. Um, and uh, also the, um, the master data creation, which also came as part of the, the GRV process on the first take on of a product. Um, so where people were creating in uh, the master data or the, the URMs of a product incorrectly, what that meant is that the system was trying to locate it incorrectly. So it was looking at, um, at location sizes or location types that didn't fit the product. So you had the, the put away um, MHE drivers taking that to a bin location um, that, that was totally missized. So those guys would then, uh, because of the culture in the place, and we can talk to that a little bit um, in a moment, because of the culture of the place, the, those MHE drivers would simply put that pallet of stock onto the floor or put it into a bin location that, more, that was more suited to it, but without doing that systematically, without reporting that back into an inventory team, um, et cetera. So, so that, was, that was really hard. And, and what that translated into was, stock take off the stock take off the stock take until we got that that correct um disciplinary measures and then also in, in one of the optimization points that we'll talk to was actually the zoning of the warehouse and that that was a major uh change we'll talk to that um probably in a little bit more detail in that optimization phase of our discussion Mark. yeah no, i mean it sounds like a lot of the historical processes from have from before have you had a wms existed with your team right and and that's probably part of the training and change uh process right yeah and that yeah. so that was the thing for me is uh not coming in with any sort of preconceived ideas about who were good performers and who were bad performers um in fact if you had asked me a couple of weeks into the into the rollout i would have given you a pretty different view of some of the staff and the culture and the um the performance indicators per person uh than the legacy people from the business would have given you some of the people who they told me were amazing were the were the ones who were really underperforming and and when I, I say that I say that with respect I don't mean it with any disrespect um the guys they, they they claimed up a little bit there was there was a lot of nervousness um you've got to remember that in these environments that guys have have closed off on a Friday night doing job a and coming to work on Monday to now start doing job b and they were quite unsure of how they were going to do it and I don't think that the communication lines were open enough to be able to come and say, you know what, Michael or Tim, this is a this is a challenge for me. This is not working. Um, mm. So so people were used to traditionally used to sort of making up their own mind as to how things should be fixed, and they were mm. trying to enact those old processes. So it's exactly what you're saying is, you know, going into a new system environment, dragging along, kicking and screaming, <laughs> dragging along old processes, the traditional processes. It was a really difficult time. 